Well, welcome. So we're here for uh, an author's talk, as usual. Uh, this is for Eccentric Orbits, The Iridium Story, written by John Bloom, to my left. Uh, to my right, we have actually two distinguished guests as well with us, Dan Collisey and Ray uh, Leopold, uh, both very distinguished in their fields. I will let John handle their own intros, but we're actually really, really lucky to have them with us. They're two of the stars of this book. Uh, without further ado, John Bloom. Thank you. Well, this is kind of a one-of-a-kind event because uh, and um, I feel like the uh, second grade kid who goes, gets to read My Pet Goat to the President because um, uh, we have today in the audience, as Jacob said, the two main characters in my book, and these guys are eminent beyond belief. Uh, the first is Dr. Ray Leopold, um, Air Force officer, expert, expert on maneuver warfare fighter plane tactics, tactics that he developed into tactics for the business world, uh, formerly a teacher at the Air Force Academy, a senior air staff at the Pentagon, a pure scientist who helped me greatly during the writing of the book, and um, more, to, more to the point at this gathering, the inventor of the Iridium satellite system, um, the most complex engineering system um, ever put into space. And um, Ray is the star of the first half of the book. So would you stand up, Ray, so everyone can appreciate you being here. Uh, and then we also have Dan Colusi, the savior of Iridium after the Motorola Corporation threatened to destroy the largest satellite constellation ever created. Uh, Dan is the star of the second half of the book. Now, uh, one of the themes running through the book is that uh, Dan was retired and playing golf in uh, Palm Beach, Florida when all this happened. In fact, he was just learning to play golf because when he was younger, he thought golf was just an excuse for businessmen to goof off, so he never learned how to play the game. But after many years of running airlines and he ran a corporation called UNC that many of you might be familiar with, uh, he promised his wife he wouldn't be running any more companies. And then he keeps getting sucked back in because he can't stand to see these satellites destroyed. Um, so he's 60, when he was 69 years old. So I, I got to know Dan, and he helped greatly with the book because he never throws anything away. Any piece of paper that ever crosses his desk, he keeps it. And so his archive rivals the Alexandrian Library in size. But it was a great resource when you're writing a book like this where people have faulty memories or... They lie about what happened, which is more often the case. But anyway, Dan made a fool out of me because now he's 80, 85 years old and he's running three companies. So it's not so big a deal that he, that he did the Iridium thing when he was 69. But stand up, Dan, and thanks for being here today. And uh, we have kind of a historic event because these two men had never met until about one hour ago. So... But um, anyway, in 1990, at the Hayden Planetarium in New York City, the Motorola Corporation, which at that time was the most powerful electronics company in the world, announced the most expensive and complicated engineering project in history. And it was more complicated than Los Alamos, uh, because that project was only doing one thing, and Iridium was doing many things. And what it was is a system of autonomous action satellites that would function as cell phone towers in the sky. And for the first time, um, every inch of the planet would be accessible by phone. So they built it. It worked. It was acclaimed by systems engineers all over the world. And so why, when I met Dan Colusi 19 years later, had I never even heard of it? Um, I met Dan through a mutual friend, and Dan was interested in getting somebody to help with his memoirs. He wanted somebody to help edit his memoirs, and I was talking to him about that, and in the course of doing that, he tells me the Iridium story, and I said, wait, what? Tell me that again. I can't, I don't believe you. They did what? And so he told me again. And they, he just told me the general outlines of what happened, the involvement of the Pentagon, the involvement of Bill, of Bill Clinton, the Clinton administration, the White House, the Secretary of Defense, a telephone company in Saudi Arabia that was connected to the bin Laden group. Uh, and all of that was fascinating. But the main thing he showed me was a 3D file of the satellites in motion. And those satellites were beautiful. Now, 
engineers, and I think it's a room full of engineers, so you'll know what I'm talking about. Engineers are not a sentimental bunch. Um, but I have a passage in the book about the huge number of people over the years who fell in love with these low Earth orbit uh, satellites. Um, and they used that language when they would talk about them. I loved those satellites. Those satellites were gorgeous, you know. Many of them used the word my. They were my satellites, you know, as though they were in love with these satellites. So anyway, I hear this story about one of the most amazing engineering projects of the last century that became the biggest bankruptcy in American history. It was the year before Enron, so that record got shattered pretty fast. But if you ask a Wall Street guy what he remembers about Iridium, he'll tell you, oh, that huge flame out, you know. Oh, that thing where Motorola screwed up so bad. Motorola wanted to crash those things into the ocean. They probably should have crashed those things into the ocean. So I'm hearing this bipolar story, you know. Yes, greatest engineering project ever. Yes, biggest bankruptcy ever. But I'm hearing it years after the, the, the main events happened. So I go off for a while and I talk to people, uh, uh, people associated with Iridium, people associated with Motorola, and I ask all the obvious questions, and there are a remarkable number of people who refuse to talk about it. Now, nothing makes a reporter more interested in the story than people refusing to talk about something. So Bill Clinton didn't want to talk about it. Al Gore didn't want to talk about it. The Secretary of Defense at the time, Bill Cohen, he didn't want to talk about it. 90% of the people involved at the Motorola Corporation didn't want to talk about it. Ray, you were a notable exception. Thank you so much. So who wanted to talk about it? The engineers certainly wanted to talk about it. The scientists wanted to talk about it. The civil servants wanted to talk about it. The bureaucrats, you know, the, the, the maligned bureaucrats, they said, I want to tell you about that. And what they would say was startling. Because, you know, my first question is, how do you eat through $11 billion in nine months and bankrupt a company that's been in, that's, that's been in the works for 12 years? Well, um, maybe it was because the phone weighed almost a pound and was a brick long after the age of the brick had passed. Because Motorola, by the way, had invented the brick, you know, the original Dynatac uh, back in the 70s. But the Iridium phone, it, it looked kind of like a World War II walkie-talkie with a giant antenna on it. And it was even worse than a brick. It was like a brick with a baguette sticking out of it because it had this giant antenna on the top. And it retailed for $3,500. So that might be part of the reason. And then there was the business plan. Motorola was seeking an elusive creature called the International Business Traveler. That's who was going to buy the phone. The guy who needs to be connected wherever he goes in the world. But by the time they developed the phone, rolled out the phone, started selling the phone, that guy had been blessed with a slim phone that worked on the GSM system and therefore was capable of roaming. Roaming was never popular, but roaming worked. And it didn't, that phone didn't work everywhere, like Iridium, didn't work in the ocean, didn't work at the South Pole, it wasn't global, it just worked in the places where the people are. So, um, the next question I ask is, who came up with this idea in the first place? And the answer was, three engineers in the most obscure part of the Motorola Corporation. Um, in fact, they called it Motorola Siberia. Um, it was the Chandler Lab in Chandler, Arizona. All three guys had worked on the Star Wars program. Official name was the Strategic Defense Initiative. But um, they tell me there are two people in the world who understand the full Star Wars program. I haven't found them yet, but Ray knows a lot about it. Um, they worked with these autonomous uh, um, kinetic kill vehicles. <laughs> autonomous kinetic kill vehicles, satellites. And the three inventors at, at uh, Motorola incorporated all that technology into what would become the largest civilian space project in history at the time, thinking that the future of the world would have millions of people using satellite phones. Because, look, what do we do today? We build cell towers every one to five miles. We try to build cell towers every one to five miles all the way across the planet. In fact, more than, more than one to five miles because each service provider has to do his own cell tower one to five miles all the way across the planet, except you can't build them 
on most parts of the planet. So no more than about 14% of the planet will ever be covered with cell towers. So in 1987, and actually today, it seems like people would say, let's put them in the sky. Doesn't that make a whole lot more sense than the way we're trying to do it? Um, so my next question was, wh why didn't the rest of the world think the same thing? The rest of the world did think the same thing. There were at least a dozen other satellite phone companies formed in the early 90s, including one created by uh, Bill Gates and uh, Craig McCaw, uh, Kirkland's own Craig McCaw, um, that called the Teledesic System. Some of you may be, may be familiar with it. That would have provided the holy grail broadband in the sky. So what happened to all those? Well, they went bankrupt too, was the answer. So why did Iridium survive? Because of this one guy here, this retired businessman who was playing golf in Palm Beach, had no previous experience with satellites or outer space, had no money of his own to buy it, and, uh, and uh, uh, his single-minded persistence resulted in the deal of the century, really, that, that saved the Iridium system. So. In order to write this book, when people won't talk to you, what do you do? You go get their email is what you do. So I filed a Freedom of Information Act request, and the result is that they turned up 18,000 pages of documents dealing with Iridium at the William Jefferson Clinton Library in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, then they wouldn't give those documents to me. Uh, they told me they had them, but they wouldn't give them to me. Uh, oh, Clinton has to read them first. Oh, Obama has to read them first before they can be released. Next month, maybe. Next month, next month, next month. This went on forever. And then finally, lo and behold, they released 17,000 of the 18,000 pages of documents. Okay, that's the good news. The bad news is now I have to read 17,000 pages of government documents, including hundreds of pages of handwritten notes. And the handwriting of White House economists and national security people is not good, I'll tell you right now. I don't know if any of you have ever been to uh, the Clinton Library, but if you ever get a chance, don't. Um, <laughs> although uh, they do have a gift shop there with a Bill Clinton bobblehead doll that I would recommend in case, well, uh, unfortunately it's not anatomically correct, so you can't use it to explain the Monica Lewinsky scandal to young children. But at any rate, the contemporary architect who designed the Clinton Library put it up on stilts and made it long and narrow, and so locals quickly noticed that it looked like a giant trailer house up on blocks. Therefore, it's known in Little Rock as Bill's Double Wide. So I spent several weeks in Bill's Double Wide, and, and by the way, was almost jailed three times for violating various Clinton Library regulations, um, crimping the upper left corner of a stapled document is a capital offense in Little Rock, apparently, and because you have to go up and have the staple officially removed by the person at the front of the room, which every time, if you, if you did that, every time you have a staple, uh, you would be there for seven years, you know. So um, there were 24 boxes of Iridium documents, and each box has a dozen or so bulky folders, and I was also found guilty of the infraction of having more than one folder open at any given time without returning it to its proper box. And finally, I just said, stop. Listen to me, people. You don't have to worry about the document being permanently crimped because only one person is ever going to read any of this stuff, and you're looking at him. And so some of the more sympathetic librarians, or actually don't call them librarians, they're always archivists. Archivists, they are never librarians. Um, they eventually allowed me to crimp and scan. So I won't try to uh, summarize the whole story, but Dan Colusi uh, comes into my story where Motorola is threatening to destroy the satellites because the business plan has failed. So he has to ask himself the question, if he's going to rescue the system, the business plan failed, so who is going to use these phones? He, so he says, who needs the phone? Who has to have that phone? Who can't live without it? And he finds that the answer to that is, well, CIA agents love the phone. People working alone love the phone. Uh, drug enforcement agents love it even more than the CIA agents because they're working in the jungles of Colombia, and the drug dealers in Colombia have the phone already. So um, Marines in small units in Bosnia want, love the phone. 
Oil exploration companies in remote uh, places love the phone. Uh, small craft on the open sea love the phone. Fishermen, mining companies, people in the most isolated parts of Africa, trekkers at the North Pole, um, but especially guys with secret identities who sneak across borders in the dead of night. They want this phone. So Dan Colusi says, okay, so it's obvious. I got to go to the Pentagon, right? Goes to the Pentagon. Obviously, you guys need this phone, right? Nope. Nope. We're not interested. The military uses secure phones that are run from Cheyenne Mountain, and we don't need any phone that anybody can buy that was invented for Playboys in Monaco. No. So the Navy was especially negative, and the Navy sort of controls all telecommunications for the military. Or were they, or were they telling him the truth? Because when he made his first visit to the Pentagon, this enthusiastic, youthful, bouncy civilian suddenly shows up out of nowhere and says, I'm, I'm here to guide you through the process, Mr. Colusi. And uh, his name was Mark Adams, a man with strange credentials from a corporation many of you are familiar with, I'm sure, the MITRE Corporation. Um, uh, it, tends, it tends to have ex-CIA heads in, as its president. Uh, Colusi had at one time been president of uh, Pan Am Airlines when uh, terrorists were regularly hijacking his planes to uh, Cuba and, and he was somewhat familiar with uh, government agents and his spook detector went off when this, when this guy showed up. And from there the story got stranger and stranger and stranger because the spies wanted the phone but the generals didn't want the phone. The Marines at Camp Pendleton, the first responders in war, they wanted the phone because it works on the move and it's handheld. And they didn't have a phone like that. In fact, it would later prove indispensable in Afghanistan and in Iraq. The scientists in charge of operations at the South Pole were begging for the phone. So let me put this in context. A satellite constellation conservatively estimated to be worth $6.5 billion is about to be destroyed by its operator the Motorola Corporation, at a time when any Fortune 500 corporation could acquire it for what amounts to pocket change. But there are no bidders, and the military is not inclined to step in. So Dan Colusi goes to Motorola and says, let me come up with a plan to get the system. They scoff at him. They say, surely you don't think you can use this for data. You know, it's too slow for that. He goes to all the other co-owners of, uh, of Iridium, 28 companies around the world. They're apoplectic with rage because they feel like Motorola sold them this bill of goods and now they have this worthless company, so none of them want to put up the money to get it out of bankruptcy court. He goes to every service provider in the world telling them they could own the system for pennies on the dollar. Actually, it wasn't even a single penny on the dollar. It was mills on the dollar, but nobody knew that yet. And nobody was willing to take a chance on this system. He goes to an investment banker that he's known for 35 years, a classmate from Harvard Business School. And that guy promises to put up enough money to buy the system out of bankruptcy and run it for a year. And then he backs out at the last minute, very publicly, tells the New York Times that the company is worthless. Um, and, and in fact, it was so public that the State Department informed Russia that non-nuclear debris would be coming out of the sky so that Russia wouldn't mistake the falling satellites for incoming missiles. Meanwhile, the government, and that's an indication of how the government was panicking. A dozen different agencies are writing memos. They're making plans for the moment when 88 satellites, there's 66 in the constellation, but there are a lot of spares up there, and there were some that failed before they got to their operational orbit. So 88 satellites are going to be jolted out of their flight path and allowed to plunge to Earth. Especially annoyed by this is the president, Bill Clinton, who says, that is not going to happen on my watch, only to find out he has no authority over the satellites because they were launched entirely by private industry. And in fact, there are foreign governments, including China and Russia, who are part owners of the system, whereas the Pentagon is a mere customer of the system. So China and Russia have more control over the system than we do. And then, now listen to this very carefully. The owner of the Black Entertainment Network asks one of his female talk show hostesses to set up a meeting with the Secretary of Defense so that some friends of Jesse Jackson 
can provide phone service with the Iridium system to villages in Africa. Do you need me to say that again? The owner of the Black Entertainment Network asked one of his female talk show hostesses to set up a meeting with the Secretary of Defense so that some friends of Jesse Jackson can provide phone services to villages in Africa. Bob Johnson is his name. He comes to the aid of a group of African-American investors, all friends of Jesse Jackson, who have noticed the way Dan Colosi is being treated and don't like it and think that Iridium can be used for communications in remote African villages, which is an idea that resonates deeply within the Clinton administration because they were always looking for ways to help Africa. Hence, one of the oddest business partnerships in history is formed. But they still don't have quite enough money, so they seek additional funding from Saudi Arabia. And the story gets stranger still. Anyway, all of this is in the book, but I went on this journey that took me all over the country, interviewing some of the thousands of people who were involved with Iridium, including Ray Leopold, who, who by the way, lives in northwest Montana, pretty much the hardest place to get to in the whole continental United States. <laughs> And then, and, then, and then I called Ray over and over again. Every day I would call Ray and say, I'm an English major, you know. So I would call Ray, and Ray said something, Ray said something very wise. Ray said, um, you know, uh, I was always a science geek, and I was always bad in every other subject, but everywhere I went to school, high school, college, when I got my master's, when I got my PhD, they would always make me take an English course. He says, uh, you're an English major. How many times did they make you take a science course? <laughs> and, Touche, right? Never. You know, once or twice, but you could easily get out of them. And uh, uh, the way the story plays out, anyway, it's uh, full of twists and turns and dirty tricks and revenge, and it's sort of a secret history of the four or five people who saved Iridium. Um, but I wanted to wind up these remarks with things that were so strange that I never even thought about them before encountering this book. Uh, uh, one short section in the book is the history of the car radio because the name Motorola comes from motor in a car combined with Victrola, sound in a car. And the whole culture of that company evolved from being the guys who started putting electronics in automobiles. So I had to learn all about that. Nazi rocket scientists play a big part in this story. <laughs> Because when they launched the first um, um, uh, intercontinental missile from the Peenemund uh, Research Center in um, Germany during World War II, the toast they gave that day, this was the V-2 missile that they used to bomb London, the toast they gave that day was not about winning the war, it was about making satellites possible. <laughs> and so they were science geeks too, you know, they were just on the wrong side. Of course, we brought them on, on our side pretty quickly. Um, secret Chinese launch complexes. Um, Iridium was the first commercial space launch in China. Getting this feedback here. Iridium was the first commercial space launch in China. And uh, uh, when the first people went there to use the uh, Taiyuan Space Center, uh, they went, they re retired to their uh, bedrooms in the officers' quarters the first night, and the doors, they heard the sound the, of clanking. Their doors were chained shut, so the Americans couldn't get out and, you know, and, and spy on Base 25, this top-secret military installation. So uh, Danny Stamp, the rocket scientist who was running um, Iridium, had to call his Chinese partners and say, there will be no imprisonment of Motorola's, and if you don't stand down, um, forget about commercial space launches in China. And uh, they did stand down the next day, and there's no more imprisonment of, uh, of uh, Motorola's. The, uh, the uh, Air Force agreement, uh, all, all Iridium satellites have to be launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base because they're polar orbits. Now, China doesn't have any problem with launching a polar orbit over heavily populated cities. But if you launched a, if you launched a polar orbit from Cape Canaveral, you would go over uh, uh, Charleston, Charlotte, Toronto, you know, or if you, if you, if you launched south, you'd go over uh, Havana, uh, Bogota, Quito. So we never launched polar from 
uh, Cape Canaveral. So all launches are from Vandenberg Air Force Base. And the only people in danger are the people in the city of Lompoc, California. And uh, they have an agreement with the city. Um, six dead civilians, that's the limit. Seven dead civilians is too many. And apparently that's okay with Lompoc. So, <laughs> so um, why the Russian Proton rocket is the most reliable rocket in the world? When they asked Danny Stamp, the rocket guy at, at Iridium, uh, what rocket should we use? He said, any rocket other than an American rocket. I only feel safe on Russian and Chinese rockets. And the reason is he'd been in, he'd been in the war room in the 80s, and he considered, um, they thought that if in the event of nuclear war, the Russian rockets were going to outperform the American rockets. I mean, they would talk about it uh, after hours at Cheyenne Mountain in the bunker. And um, I said, uh, when I was interviewing him, I said, Danny, I mean, so that just doesn't sound right to me because uh, Russia was crumbling in the, in, throughout the 80s. And, and he says, yeah, they were doing badly in every category of civilization except nuclear warfare. <laughs> and so he, he was very impressed by the Russian Proton, and that's actually the rocket that they, that they relied on for, for many of their launches. Um, I had to learn about kinetic kill vehicles and how they work. I had to learn about maneuver warfare fighter plane tactics. I had to learn about why the inner Van Allen belt is toxic. I had the other, the other two inventors, of the other two inventors, one of them is Ken Peterson, who is a pure mathematician. And I said, what was your toughest thing that you had to do on the iridium problem, Ken? And he says, well, we had to tessellate the unit sphere. And I said, oh, Ken, it's like, uh, how long is it going to take you to explain that to me? And um, he says, you know, that's the great thing about iridium. He says, all I did, it was the greatest job I ever had, all I did for years was theorems. And I said, really? And he says, yeah, I would dream about them. In my unconscious moments, I would solve the theorems. And I was saying, Ken, you know, you're one of a kind. You're one of a kind. But um, uh, so anyway, that's, that's what you have to do to reassign the channels when you have satellites moving that fast and a moving handset. All other systems, you either have a stationary satellite or a stationary handset. Uh, this, this one, you have extremely fast-moving satellites and extremely fast-moving handsets, especially when the handset is in an airplane. Um, radio astronomy. Unfortunately, the frequency that um, Iridium, broadcast, uh, Iridium uses for its phones is uh, beloved of the 28 radio astronomy outposts around the world. And the reason is that there is a spectral band emitted by hydroxyl radicals created by interstellar dust storms coming from the direction of Orion. And it's on that frequency, it's on the iridium frequency. So the radio astronomers were up in arms. You can't use that frequency. We have to listen to the interstellar dust storms from Orion. And so uh, even though, even though uh, commercial uses always uh, are favored over the other uses by the people that allocate frequency, um, uh, Iridium made a picket fence solution so that they could continue to, so that they could share that spectrum, and uh, they share it to this day, although the astronomers are still not happy, Ray, I'd, happy, I, I'd like you to know they are still pissed off because it decreased the sensitivity of their telescopes, I don't know if you know that, but they don't work as well, <laughs> you know. Um, superstitions at the Baikonur Cosmodrome where all lo Russian launches occur. Uh, when you're on your way to the launch pad, you have to piss on the right rear tire of the bus. The reason you have to do this is that Yuri Gagarin did it, and Yuri Gagarin survived. First man in space, right? Uh, in fact, when Danny Stamp was at the, uh, when he went to the uh, Baikonur Cosmodrome, which is the most famous launch complex in the world, when he w it's in Kazakhstan, when he went there for the first time, he said, I need to see the control room that my men will be using. And the Russians kind of said, oh, you want to see the control room? Okay. And they went off and they kind of like muttered among themselves. And they came back and they said, you know what? Uh, we'll show you another control room that's exactly like the one your men will be using, but we can't show you the one your men will be using. And Danny said, um, no, that's not okay. I need to see exactly where my men will be working. The Russians go off. They mutter among themselves. They come back and they say, uh, 
okay, we'll show you the control room, but on the way to the control room, we're gonna go through another room first. And when we go through that room, we would appreciate it if you would stare directly down at the ground, walk as fast as possible, and not move your head to the right or to the left. And so I said, what did you do, Danny? And he says, I walked as slowly as possible and moved my head as much as I could to see everything in the room. <laughs> and I said, and what did you see? And he said, I saw a giant map of the Soviet Union at the bottom, an upside down map of Canada and the United States at the top, and blinking lights showing the location of every active ICBM in the world. He said, for whatever paranoid reason, they were still on alert. And I said, what did you do? And he said, I said, let's have some more vodka. We were starting the first global corporation. We had, the family had to get along. Ah, <laughs> uh, so, by, and by the way, this, the satellites, because of the, the work of these two men, the, the satellites still fly today. There's a second generation uh, going up in September. Um, most Americans still don't know that the satellites exist. Um, if they know anything about the, about, them, about the Iridium phone, they know it from the movies. Um, Robert Downey Jr. uses an Iridium phone in all the Iron Man movies. Um, Clive Cussler has Dirk Pitt use the phone in all of his stories. Uh, Brad Pitt fights zombies and saves the world with an Iridium phone in, in World War Z. Um, Actually, he doesn't show very uh, uh, much talent in using that phone in that movie. Uh, probably the most famous scene with an, with an Iridium phone is uh, Bradley Cooper in, in American Sniper. He executes the longest uh, kill shot in history, and then he's still shaking, really, from, from uh, finishing the shot, and he um, picks up his Iridium phone and extends the antenna and says, I'm ready to come home, baby. So most people remember that scene as their Iridium moment. Um, there were three events after the system was saved, there were three events that made the system famous. 9-11, um, it was the only phone that worked in New York City that day. Uh, Hurricane Katrina knocked out the entire communications infrastructure of Southern Louisiana. It was the only communications device that worked there. Um, Afghanistan, in most of the places where troops were deployed, it was the only phone that worked, including many of the military phones. Um, there have been traditions now grown up around the Iridium phone. If you get to the summit of Mount Everest, the first thing you do, you make an Iridium phone call. Guess where I am? If you get to the South Pole, the first thing you do is you make an Iridium phone call. Guess where I am? Many uh, countries and, and, and um, aid organizations have installed it as standard safety equipment. Um, I have to tell one more story about Ray, though. Ray's a Boy Scout leader in uh, northwest Montana, and uh, they go on survival hikes, and they don't take Iridium phones. You don't take Iridium phones with you because they think it would be an unfair advantage. <laughs> um, but um, I wanted to take, since I know that you're all engineers, are, are any of you, are, 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 uh, are, are any of you, any of you work with radio frequency spectrum? No? Okay, well, you're going to listen to this anyway, because, <laughs> because uh, I think engineers can appreciate this. Um, there's a chapter of the book in which Motorola sends about 100 people to a United Nations meeting in Torremolino, Spain, to get the spectrum that they need to launch the constellation. Ray told me about this meeting, and it sounded like the most boring thing you ever said to me, Ray. And I was like, I was kind of zoning out as you told me, until he told me the part about Motorola hiring Russian-speaking spies to inveigle information out of the KGB during the conference while the French government was bugging the hotel rooms of the Motorola guys and rifling through their suitcases. Okay, now it's getting more interesting. You know, all that's in the book too. But in the course of researching this chapter about the most brutal politics I've ever encountered in my life at this thing called the World Administrative Radio Conference in Spain, I was introduced to the International Table of Frequency Allocations. Now, I called a, f a friend who's a book editor when I got to this place in the book, and I said, I've just arrived at the most daunting task I've ever encountered in my entire career. I have this thing. It's thousands of pages. It's multicolored. It's incomprehensible. It resembles the world's longest hippie peace quilt. 
it's impossible to make this interesting. And he says, well, you know, it, 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 it doesn't really sound like, is it that important to the story? And I said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, now I know. The International Table of Frequency Allocations pretty much determines the future of the world. And he goes, oh, yeah, well, yeah, like, okay, I guess that's important then. Well, I, well, I know you, you'll figure that out, you know. So fast forward to a few months ago. The book is done. The editors have messed around with it. The lawyers have read it, you know. I had to go have three long days of meetings just with the Saudi Arabian lawyers, the Saudi Arabian investors named Prince, Prince Khalid. So I'm at a Christmas party, and I see this editor, and he's very happy with the book. And uh, uh, so I say, hey, uh, you know, he's telling me what he likes, this and that and the other. And I say, hey, what, what about that international table of frequency allocations thing? And he says, oh, that's my favorite chapter in the book. Okay, I can die now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for being an attentive audience. And uh, do you have any, any questions uh, uh, for me or for Dan Colusi or for Ray Leopold? Yes. Oh, okay. The question is, there's a phenomenon called iridium flare um, uh, in which uh, there's a bright, uh, 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 it looks like a comet in the sky. Um, and uh, uh, how, did that, how did that occur and how did you plan that, right? Actually, that was, there was unplanned and uh, the giant iridium flares are uh, a phenomenon that has caught the imagination of people around the world. In fact, all you have to do is Google iridium giant flare, and you'll see photos of these flares from around the world. Uh, if you look in the book, you'll see a photo of the iridium satellite. The iridium satellite's a three-sided uh, uh, satellite, like a, a, a triangular cylinder. And then flopping out from those three sides are main mission antennas that operate in the uh, L-band frequency range. And that's where the satellites communicate directly with the users on the ground. Well, those are planar phased arrays that have a very shiny surface. And, and the uh, attitude and orbit control system for the satellites is uh, pretty precise. So you know the orientation of the satellite, you know the uh, um, position of the satellite at any point in time. And there's a, um, a website called heavensabove.com. You can just go in and put in your own latitude and longitude and uh, just after sunset or just before sunrise, you'll be able to see these giant flares as they reflect the sun down into your portion of the Earth. And I don't know who it was at heavensabove.com that did all the calculations, but it's purely deterministic, and it's not going to last too much longer. Because on September 17th, uh, the company that currently owns Iridium is replacing the constellation with a new uh, satellite that is not the same physical configuration, and those giant flares won't be happening anymore. So if you've never seen them, they're rather spectacular. I was on top of the mountain close to where I live in northwest Montana. Uh, on the darkest night of the year, every year in August, all the astronomers go up there, and I went up there one time with them, and boom, what was that? Boom, another one, what was that? And these astronomers, they were stupid, I guess. They didn't know what I said, those are iridium giant flares. Oh, you know, and then, you know, they, they find a song. So. And they're nine times brighter than Venus, I think, well, which was previously the, the brightest thing in the sky. Uh, at, at their peak, they're, yeah, they're that correct. bright. <clears throat> and, and actually, if you go to the heavens book the, uh, dot tar, dot com, it'll tell you how bright it should be uh, for any particular iridium giant flare. So you know, we need a cloudless sky. But the, but you don't have to do that, right? You can get an app. There's an app okay. called Iridium Flare. You just get the app. It tells you, it, it, it gets your GPS position. It tells you where you are. It tells you where the next flare is, where to point your camera. Be, do it the lazy way. You, know, you, can, you can prank people. You can, you can say there's going to be a UFO event tonight. Exactly. And, and, but, but I've got to tell you, these same radio astronomers who hate us using the 20 centimeter wavelength band, you know, where they want to uh, uh, you know, listen without looking through the picket fence. Uh, you know, when they go home at night and they're just the amateurs, they like to see the iridium giant flares too. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Hello. Hello. 
Uh, so security was probably a primary concern when you all were working on setting up Iridium. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, some of the concerns you have, some of the issues you had to overcome, especially with traffic like CIA going through it? I'm sure it was kind of tough to... Okay, the, the Iridium system um, is, is actually the first commercial use of both a packet switch ne network and a circuit switch network integrated together. Up until that time, all the uh, communication systems tied to the public switch telecommunication system around the world uh, was circuit switched. Uh, when we created the architecture of the Iridium system, we made the constellation of satellites, and the satellites are six planes of satellites that go up one side of the Earth, come down the other, with the Earth rotating underneath it. And those six planes of satellites have 11 satellites per plane. Each satellite communicates with the satellite directly in front of it. It's zero degrees azimuth, minus 16 degrees elevation. The one behind it, 180 degrees azimuth, minus 16 degrees elevation. And then the, the ones to the left and to the right, well, the ones to the left and to the right, when the satellites are coming together at the poles and then cross over at the poles and go the other way, you have uh, the, uh, the direction that you're going to the other satellite constantly changing. And, and so those intersatellite links uh, actually change direction. We have slotted phase arrays that change the direction. And because uh, the uh, change becomes so excessive at the high latitudes, we shut them off at plus 68 degrees latitude, minus 68 degrees latitude, and then reacquire them when the satellite gets over to the uh, 68 degrees of latitude on the other side of the Earth. Well, that entire constellation of satellites and every subscriber in the Iridium system are in a packet switch system. And then the, each of the satellites has the ability to go down to a gateway, and the gateway is just, uh, you know, the main gateway is in uh, Tempe, Arizona, and there's always at least one satellite uh, visible from every point on the surface of the Earth. And so as the satellites go by, they hand off the gateway from satellite to satellite, and when you get down to the ground, to that uh, um, uh, switching center on the ground, and each uh, Iridium ground station acts as an international switch, it's, it's converted to the uh, um, circuit switch system. So Iridium was the first realization of packet switch uh, uh, connected together with circuit switch. Uh, now with respect to security, it turns out that when you have packet switch system, and you have the geometry like you do with Iridium, you get a certain amount of security just from the basic Iridium system. Well, then we also interleave the, uh, uh, the bits. We use forward error correction. Uh, the packets uh, are 414 uh, bits per packet. Uh, the framing for the Iridium system for the user links is 90 millisecond frame. The time slots for any burst of energy for one of those packets is 8.28 milliseconds, and a lot of that 90 millisecond frame is guard, uh, just so we don't have any interference uh, from satellite to satellite. And we do use some of that guard time in each time slot for the ringing system and the paging system in the Iridium network. So just the geometry and the architecture, the interleaving, the forward error correction affords us so much communication security that we didn't have to put a lot in on top of it. Nevertheless, the Department of Defense decided they wanted their own gateway, and it's in the Hawaiian Islands. And we put a, an applique on top of the user units, and then another applique in the government gateway in Hawaii that offers them communication security beyond what the Iridium system has in and of itself. Did that answer the question? <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, and Iridium was the uh, uh, the first non-country to get its own country code. What's the country code of well, Iridium? It, it, it's 8816. 8816. Yeah. 8816 yeah. is, is the nation of Iridium. There's two, two country codes. Yeah, there's two country codes, and then Global Star has one that's adjacent to it. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, the U.S. has country code one. A single digit, <laughs> and there, there's a couple other countries that have one, like Russia's seven, but uh, you know some other important countries have two digits. Well, we're kind of down in the pecking order. <laughs> so. Hi, uh, really fascinating talk. So, uh, what does it take to operate the constellation? Is there like a control room that 
it's filled with people monitoring and, and adjusting things? Is it highly automated? What, what does that look like today, and how might it be changing with the new system? Ray, that's you. You're the expert. <laughs> and we, we built the Iridium, what we call the SNOC, the System and Network Operation System uh, Center uh, in Lansdowne, Virginia. And, um, uh, right near Dulles Airport. Yeah, near Dulles Airport. And uh, uh, it turns out that the satellites are relatively autonomous. And uh, it also turns out that when we looked at the, the requirements that came from the communication system, because the satellites uh, project onto the Earth's surface cells like a cellular telephone network, but unlike the cellular telephone network, instead of the user moving through the beams, the beams move through the users because the satellites are going 7,500 meters per second. And um, it turns out that when we looked at what the actual re communication system requirement was, uh, it wasn't that tight. But it turned, it, what we learned was we saved fuel on the satellite by updating the position of the satellite more frequently. And so when you think about it, the communication system needed each satellite to be uh, in a certain area in space that looked like a sausage. You know, uh, and as long as the satellite was in its sausage, the communication system would work okay. Well, we save fuel by making that sausage real small. And we do the, uh, the orbital corrections in the polar regions where we, we could shut down cells because, you know, we could have a lot of satellites over a pole at any one time, and only one cell needs to be on in, in that particular region. So when we have those uh, user links turned off, we can do some small uh, corrections, and as a result, we keep a very tight uh, uh, orbit control. Uh, the attitude is, is maintained primarily with the single pitch momentum wheel that we have in the satellite. It's about a, a 30 pound mass uh, um, uh, momentum wheel, and we also augment that with the, uh, uh, the signal instruction in our satellite links. We've actually had momentum wheels fail on satellites where we continue to uh, keep the satellite in orbit by doing the attitude and orbit uh, adjustments with knowledge of what we get from the inter-satellite links. That was the number one issue. When, I, when, uh, when we first took over Iridium, I asked the CEO who was retiring at that time, what's, what's the number one problem we're gonna have? And he, was, he said, these uh, momentum wheels will fail in mechanical devices, and we've already lost a few of them. And uh, he said, you're gonna lose a lot of these, and it's gonna really screw things up. So I, so I brought Boeing and you guys had left by then and uh, said, you know, can't we use our little retro rockets when these things fail, these uh, wheels, to, uh, uh, to uh, position the satellites and they come up with software. So that any time, I think we've lost six or eight of them, I'm not sure where we are today, Ray, but quite a few of them. And uh, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the software takes over and it you know, you know, uh, keeps it in uh, position. Uh, so the solar panels always get the sun and so forth. So that's been a lifesaver. I mean, that, would, that could have been a real disaster. And uh, I think the big thing that Ray designed into this was the fact that we can change the software uh, in the constellation. When they go over the North Pole, we have, uh, we have several ground stations in uh, different uh, locations within the Arctic Circle. And we set up new software. So we've done that dozens of times now. Every time we have a major crisis, you know, technical crisis, we figure it out. Our group of engineers down in Tempe, uh, uh, Dr. Chandler, uh, Arizona, and we can send that new software up. And that's and that's very unique. There's I don't think there's a satellite system today, Ray. You might you might know this better than I that has this capability where we can send out new software to take care of anomalies. And that's worked probably hundreds of times in the last 15 years where we saw a problem and we could fix it by sending out new software. So I am fortunate enough to have both hosted this event and get the last question before we uh, wrap up and go to signing. Um, I'm actually, as much as I am an engineer and curious about all these engineering details, I am fascinated by the show of will and confidence that you, Dan, put into resurrecting this project, especially against all of the odds that John has talked about, including the, the, the purchase price, which was, as, as you noted, like half a penny on the dollar, an incredible purchase price, but still a lot of money, not money you had you know, to, to follow your vision, right? So 
what, what made kind of formal this notion that you were really going to do this? What made you, what forced your hand sort of to, to well, take I this action? Well, back the days that I ran Pan American World Airways, which we flew to, uh, you know, 120 cities all over the world, and we had a patchwork uh, terrestrial system. It was, you know, every, every system you could think of we had. And it worked most of the time, but not all the time. And uh, so suddenly I hear about this system, you know, 66 satellites in the sky that uh, works all the time and it's beautiful. And, uh, and it communicate with airplanes, ground stations, ships, whoever. And I'm, and I'm thinking, and somebody said, they're gonna destroy this. Said, Why is that? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I mean, they spent $6 billion already. And uh, so I just got very interested in it and made him an offer, uh, $25 million. And of course, the banks who were the secured creditors, this is jump change, forget it. <laughs> and I said, well, that's all I have, I'm sorry. So uh, that's it. So uh, they, I mean, they accepted it. But it, it was really, uh, not, not that I'm all that specific so much, but it, it was really my, uh, I, uh, I hate to say it was altruistic because every time I say that publicly, people, you know, look look a little strange at me. But, uh, <laughs> but it 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 just seemed, uh, you know, a complete insanity that you would take this system of working technically beautifully, and because it had a bad business plan, they were going to destroy it. And uh, it just was so stupid to me I couldn't believe it. Uh, and uh, so I just got in the fray and started making, you know, offers and uh, uh, ran into lots of, uh, you know, difficulties. But at the end of the day, it survived. And we owned the system for uh, $25 million. I sort of ran out of money and said, finally, with the banks. On the 25, by the way, uh, I can only give you six and a half cash, and it should take an 18 and a half million dollar loan, 10%. <laughs> <laughs> So this woman who was in charge of the consortium of 38 banks said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> and uh, so they took And a actually, uh, years later, the uh, business columnist for USA Today was looking for a parallel in terms of a resource that was bought for such a low price that resulted to be as valuable as it turned out to be. And the only parallel I could find was Louisiana Purchase. So, <laughs> and, and I should say, in, in terms of altruism, there were, there were four or five people in the government, not famous people in the government, not the top people in the government, but a person at the White House, a person at the FCC, and a person in the Pentagon who were not well known. I could tell you their names. They're in the book, but you wouldn't know them. Uh, who fought like crazy to make sure these things weren't crashed, even after the whole world was preparing for the destruction of the constellation. And as I said, they'd sent out messages to Russia saying it's gonna happen on a certain day. The software was written, the kill yourself, the suicide software was written. Um, and there were these three or four people. And when I interviewed Kathy Brown, who was chief of staff at the FCC uh, about this, she said, you know, when you spend your whole life in government service, uh, there's a lot of gray areas and there's very few things where, you, where at the end of the day, you can say, I'm proud to have been part of that, but I'm proud to be one of the saviors of Iridium. And that's the way these, uh, these government people, that never, they, didn't, they didn't benefit a single penny from it, but they were just like, this is, out, this is outrageous. The White House economist who was involved was told strictly by the White House legal office, do not get involved in the bankruptcy. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's unethical. Uh, all you can get involved in is public safety. And she just said, screw that. I'm getting involved in the bankruptcy. And she was one of the key people that set up the key meetings that caused the system uh, to be saved and you know a lot of these people they were dealing with were uh, uh, veteran politicians who just like take the you know see what's in the wind and decide whether they want to risk their career on this or whether it's worth fighting for or whatever and you had these lower level people pushing them saying do the right thing do the right thing do the right thing save it save it save it save it until finally it saved the, the higher level people finally at the very end 
after, after meeting in the White House Situation Room <laughs> Uh, with 12 agencies there, finally uh, did the right thing. And, and throughout that period, every day, Motorola was saying, okay, we're destroying it on Tuesday. Okay, we're destroying it next week. I think they threatened 18, 19 times to destroy it. The only thing I was going to add is that um, we don't have exact figures on this, but there are thousands and thousands of lives that have been saved by Riddle Constellation. Uh, yeah, from all over the world in all kinds of circumstances. And there have been so much, uh, you know, communication uh, from these very uh, remote parts of the world that would never have had any means to communicate. And uh, this, is, this is really very gratifying to me because now, starting September of this year, we're going to put up the next generation. It's another, uh, you know, three or four billion dollars. But we have the cash flow now to do that because now we have you know 500,000 plus um, uh, uh, people actually paying money. And when we get to the next generation, which will be 15 or 20 years from now, we'll have so much cash flow we won't you know we'll just, it'll be it just won't be a problem. So now we have a system that's in uh, it's in uh, perpetuity, okay, and it's going it's and that's. Uh, to me is, I think, the greatest satisfaction. And Ray, I'm sure you feel well, that way. Let me say on behalf of Barry Berger, Ken Peterson, and I who created the system and the couple thousand people who uh, brought it into existence, thank you, Dan Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> I should also mention that the, the, the Malaysian airliner that went off the grid and was never found, uh, once the new generation of Iridium goes up, that will never happen again because of a of a system called Arion that uses Iridium so that there will, no, no matter what air traffic control system you're in, anywhere in the world, you're never off the grid. We so, will track every airplane, every commercial airplane, 7 by 24, 365, uh, until it disappears on the surface of the earth. So and if we'll have altitude, speed, uh, direction, all nine yards, so there'll be no more Malaysian airlines. That won't happen until 2018, but it's coming. So if it goes into the water, they'll know exactly where it went into the water. Well, and you'll have all the parameters going down. You know, the right. Thanks again to all our speakers, Ray Leopold, Dan Colusi, and John Bloom. There'll be a signing. <laughs>